This morning, I'm going to do some teaching, and so I really want you to lean in and listen here this morning. You know, one of the things I like to do when I speak is to uh, look for tension areas in the body of Christ. And what I mean by that is I try to think of things that, that affect you directly, issues that people are dealing with, maybe issues that the church world as a whole is dealing with. And this morning, I want to tackle a topic that many of you are familiar with, and it's this, church hurt, church hurt. So turn your Bible to the gospel of John, the gospel of John chapter eight, John chapter eight. Unfortunately, the church as a whole has been a place where a lot of people have been hurt. You know, we used to, we used to think of the church as two groups of people. You've got the believers and you've got the unbelievers, you've got the lost and you've got the found, but there's an ever-growing group of people and it's those who love Jesus, but they just struggle with church. It's a group of people that say, I love Jesus. They, they have a relationship with God. They have faith, but they just struggle when it comes to God's people. And it's usually because of hurt. And so we want to step into that and say, God, use us to help heal that. And, you know, sometimes we in the church world, sometimes we just have to own up to things that we as uh, church people have a tendency to do. And we also, at times, we have to clear up misunderstandings and then hopefully help bind the wounds that you may be here or those of you watching online uh, might have when it comes to church. Now, here's the thing this morning. Regardless of the fact that God's people may have hurt you, it's always been God's heart to heal you. I'm going to say that again, regardless of the fact that God's people may have hurt you, it's always been God's heart to heal you. And so today I'm going to jump into this subject. And you know, one of the things that you often hear people say, and you've probably heard it before, is that the church is too judgmental. And I'm going to talk about that this morning. You know, I'm going to show you some, some pictures this morning of a church that judged another church's sign. And as a result, they ended up in a church war. And so let me, let me show you this morning. There was a, there was a, a Catholic church that had this sign uh, that said, all dogs go to heaven. And so the Presbyterian church uh, across the street, uh, they gave a rebuttal and they said, only humans go to heaven, read your Bible. And so then the Catholic church responded and said, God loves all of his creations, dogs included. And so the Presbyterian church, they responded. They said, dogs don't have souls. This is not open for debate. <laughs> to which the Catholic church said, Catholic dogs go to heaven. Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. <laughs> and so the Presbyterian church, they said, converting to Catholicism does not magically grant your dog a soul. To which the Catholic church responded and they said this, free dog souls with conversion. <laughs> and you know, this is so picturesque of how church people can be to really just try to correct everything that they see. You know, there's another church, you can put this sign up here. It says, whoever stole our AC units, keep one of them because it's hot where you're going. Oh my wow. Wow. <laughs> how many of you know that, that church people can be brutal? Uh, pr church people can, can say some things. And, you know, the, the University of Northern Colorado, they did a study and they found that the number one reason that people leave church is because church is too judgmental. Number one reason. And, and that's probably not surprising to you because you've probably heard somebody at some point in your life blame someone else without the right information. Maybe you've endured somebody criticizing you. Maybe you've uh, probably endured somebody not knowing the whole story 
salary, but assigning motive to what you've done. And you, if you were to be honest, you probably said something critical about someone's past, about their parenting, about their personal relationship with Jesus. And we've all seen the reality that it can wound people. And so we've kind of just got to own that as the church, that the church has had a big judgmental problem. And it's not just a giant problem, but it's a very complex problem. Because the reality is true that we as believers, that we are to carry the example of Jesus and his standard for living. And at the exact same time, we ought to embody his compassion and his acceptance of people. And so the question really quickly gets raised, how do you love people and not let the standards go? How do you love people and not let the standards go? How do we do that? Because that is the problem when it comes to most uh, judgmentalism is that we're all trying to hold a standard and at at the same time we're trying to love people and we're just stuck in the middle trying to figure that out. Now, most people in the body of Christ... They usually fall into one of two extremes, one of two camps when it comes to this, either condoners or condemners. Again, either condoners or condemners. Uh, Condoners, they say, it doesn't matter how you live. You do you. You're not going to get any pushback from me. You don't judge me. I don't judge you. No problem whatsoever. And then on the other hand, you have condemners who say, oh, it matters a great deal how you live because God is holy. And when you're not living up to his standard, I need to show you that you're doing that. And it's usually done in a way that doesn't bring restoration, but it brings condemnation. And so the condemners, they think that condoners are compromised and weak. And then the condoners, they think that the condemners are mean and petty. And so there's this back and forth fighting on where God stands on everything. And so the real question is this, which one is Jesus? Is Jesus, is he the condoner or is Jesus the condemner? Is he the the mild-mannered teacher who loves and accepts everybody with love filled in his eyes? Or is he the holy sword-wielding king with with, with fire in his eyes? Well, the answer is yes. He's both. And, and, And until we understand how he is both, we will not embody Christ or influence a culture that just thinks that we're petty and mean. And I think that the best place to unpack this is found in John chapter 8. And I want to show you how Jesus can be both. John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus has entered into the temple and he's starting to teach. And all of a sudden, he's interrupted. And in verse 3... It says this, it says, then the the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, you can only imagine the tension of this moment because this lady there, I mean, she's been caught in the act of adultery. She's been drugged there by religious leaders, and there's a crowd there. This isn't a a private meeting. It's out in the open, and here's Jesus. And, And the tension is unbelievable because both groups are present here. You've got both the condoners and you've got the condemners, and they're looking at Jesus saying, Jesus, which one is it? Should we condone this or should we condemn this? And, and, and you know, they both had their cases. For instance, the, the condoners in this moment, I'm, I'm sure they're saying things like, uh, you need to leave this lady alone. Uh, she can't control who she falls in love with. Uh, you need to just let her live her life. Listen, she can be whatever she wants to be. Uh, it, 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 she can do whatever she wants to do. God loves her. If she thinks that she made a mistake by marrying that other guy and she loves this guy, that's her prerogative and that's her decision. Now here's the thing that sounds compassionate, but it isn't. And and the reason why condoning is not compassionate is this to let somebody live contrary to God's word is to let somebody live with the consequences of sin. 
You see, for a condoner, they often overlook that sin, it kills, it steals, and it destroys. That in sin, there is no joy. That in sin, there is no peace. That in sin, there is no freedom. That in sin, there is no blessing. And the reality of it is this. That the Bible is not a rule book given by a controlling God. It's a guidebook given by a loving father who wants you to avoid the things that will destroy your life. And I think that we can all agree that adultery, that it breaks up homes, it breaks hearts, and that it ruins spiritual lives with the amount of guilt and shame that comes with it. And so to condone what this lady is doing is to aid her and abet her in destroying God's destiny for her life. Amen. And of course, all of the condoner, all of the condemners, they say, Amen. But see, you got the condemners there too who are there and they're saying things like, you know, she should have uh, seen this coming. She knew better. Uh, If she would have just spent more time in temple and less time on Tinder, uh, then this never would have happened. This wouldn't have been a problem. And it appears like condemners care more about holding God's standard. But let me say this this morning. The truth is they're usually more apt to just prop up their own self-worth. You see, when I put you down, it lifts me up. When I point out what's wrong with you, it allows what's right with me to shine. And when I can keep you down, it makes me feel superior. And a lot of judgment that people give actually has nothing to do with their own true convictions as much as it has to do with their own weak self-worth. Now, when you judge, it may make you feel good for a little bit. But it's actually having negative results that you don't even realize are taking place. Uh, The first one is this. When you judge somebody else, you actually become a slave to it. And, you know, there's actually, there's been a little bit of research that's been done. and, And there's a cycle when it comes to judgment. And he can, he can, uh, put that graphic up here this morning. It, It usually starts off with your own personal feelings of inadequacy and you don't feel like you're good enough. And so instead of dealing with those feelings of inadequacy, it's usually easier to distract yourself or find temporary relief by putting somebody else down. And when you put somebody else down, it gives you a temporary sense of self-righteousness. It gives you a temporary sense of, I'm better, so therefore I don't have to see what's wrong with me because I can see what's wrong with you. The problem is, is that that feeling, it doesn't last very long, and then you eventually end up feeling bad because you're being judgmental, which leads you back to the fact that you have some things in your life that you cannot seem to put together on your frustrated with yourself and you just continue in the cycle. You know, they've actually done some studies on this and here's what they found. That people who are living with the pain of shame and inadequacy and the pain of feeling less than actually use judgment as commonly as other people use alcohol, food, or narcotics to mask the pain. And they've also found that being judgmental is just as addictive. And so let me say this this morning, that there are some out there who in your heart of hearts, you would admit that you are judgmental. You would admit that you are highly critical of other people, but you couldn't stop if you wanted to because you're addicted to it. Now, not only does it make you a slave though, it also causes your life to be audited by God. And here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. All of us uh, have heard these verses before. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, judge not lest you be judged. Verse 2, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, we have the tendency to think of this judgment here as being futuristic, but it, it, this is not speaking of a future judgment. This is immediate. Yeah. And, and it's exactly what happened to the people standing there with stones ready to condemn this lady. And John chapter eight, catch this. The Bible says that they judged her and Jesus, who is the son, the son of God standing in their midst. He does not deal with her first. His eyes immediately turn to those who are casting judgment on her. 
And, and the Bible says that he kneels down and he begins to write in the dirt. Now, the Bible does not say specifically what Jesus was writing, but most theologians agree that he began to write down the sins of those who were ca- getting ready to cast the stones. He began to write in the, in the dirt their different sins. So he began to write down, Susan is your side chick, and you didn't pay your taxes, and you gossip about everybody. He began to, to write down their sins. And listen to me this morning. When you execute judgment on another person, God immediately starts to examine your life. Your judgment doesn't cause him to look at them. It causes his eyes to look at you. And Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that from the oldest to the youngest, they began to drop their stones. Do you know why the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest? Because the oldest have the most sin just simply from living the longest. Uh, and they quickly wanted to just get out of there because they had the most to lose. And it said from the oldest to the youngest that they dropped their stones and they left. And then Jesus looks at this woman and he says in verses 10 and 11, he said, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. And all the condoners cheer. And then he says, go and sin no more. And then all the the condemners, they cheer. And and Jesus, you notice here that Jesus did not reject her. and, And yet Jesus also did not say that what she was doing was fine to continue. And so he gives a perfect example of what it is to love someone and not let God's standards go at the exact same place. And you know why that is? It's because scripture tells us that Jesus is 100% truth and he's 100% grace. He's not 50% and 50%. No, he's 100% truth and 100% grace. And it's only through both that somebody's life can actually change. And here's why. Because the truth, because without the truth, there is no healing. God's word is the only solution to the sickness of sin. I'm going to say that again. God's word is the only solution to the sickness of sin. It's the only solution. And so you can be as compassionate as anybody in the world. But if you choose not to share God's word with them, there is no healing for them. Uh, To go absent of God's word is to pour the medicine out and to never allow somebody to heal. But at the same time, without grace, nobody accepts the truth. Because, see, you can be right, but if you're unkind and and self-righteous, then nobody will accept the truth. Nobody. They They don't want to take the medicine. And so that's why it's so important for us to understand this, that when there is no connection, there will be no correction. You cannot have correction without Connection. I, I really do believe that for some, that their heart is to help people, but they are completely ineffective in doing it. Because nobody cares about what you think about them, therefore your opinion doesn't matter to them. Let me say that again. Nobody thinks that you care about them, therefore your opinion doesn't matter to them. And so your desire to show people the truth has really just become white noise and it's just completely ineffective because people can't tell that you care about them. People can't sense that you actually love them. But on the other hand, what's special is when somebody gets out from behind the screen and, and they will go to someone and they will take them out to lunch and they will listen to where they've come from and what's going on in their lives and what they're dealing with and what their hopes and their dreams are. And they'll listen long enough to then show them care and concern and they'll say something to them to the jest of, listen, it's obvious that your life is not going the way that you want it to be. And I can see that because I've been there before. Let me show you where the real answer can be 
be found because it's something I've found myself. You know, that's, that's what's actually special today, and it's very rare. It's very rare to find people that are willing to take the time to show the care, to show the concern, to show uh, the love. And, you know, my concern is that there are just so many believers out there that care more about being right than they care about helping people get into right relationship with God. I'm going to say that again. There's more people. There's, there, there's so many people out there that care more about being right than they do care about helping people get into right relationship with God. And listen this morning, it takes an extreme amount of sacrifice to actually influence someone's life. A, a, a ton of sacrifice of your time. A ton of sacrifice of investing your energy to show that you care. It takes a ton of sincerity. It takes someone that says, I'm willing to love you long enough until you're willing to listen to what I say. But today, we just want everybody to listen, and we don't want to love anybody. You know, in May of 2017, there was a, a picture that went global uh, from North London, and what you're seeing in this picture, there's a man that, a young man that was struggling deeply uh, with depression, and he decided to end his life by jumping off, a, off this bridge called the Golders Green Bridge. He made up in his mind, I'm going to take my life, I'm done, I'm over it. And so he climbs over this banister, gets to this other side, he gets to the middle of the, the bridge, and he's getting ready to jump. When somebody that was driving by saw what was getting ready to happen, and that stranger got out of their car and ran to this man and grabbed this man and put their arms around this man. And other drivers, as they began to drive by and, and saw what was happening, they too ran and they gripped this man and put their arms around this man. And you know what? They held on to this man for nearly two hours until the authorities came to help get him down safely. And if there was ever a picture to show what we ought to be and what the church ought to be, it's that right there. It's what we're looking at right there. A, a group of people who are willing to say the true thing, which is that leaping from God's word always ends in death. But to only say it from such an uncomfortably close grip of grace that it says, I will stay here and I will cling as long as it takes. I will remain hold of you and my love for you so long until you will be forced to let God get a hold of you with your life. And until we get that balance, we're going to remain irrelevant to people who look at the church and they say it's just too judgmental. And this woman in John chapter 8, she was healed by truth and grace. And we know that because she says to Jesus, Lord, which was implying that he is now the one who is guiding her life. Yes. And so she turns from sin. She's healed by grace and she begins to walk in truth. Uh, again, she turned from her sin. Yes. She was then healed by grace when she said, Lord, and then she began to walk in truth. And so there's some of you today, and that's not what you experienced in your life. Maybe you were ripped on social media. Someone judged you without knowing the motives, whatever it is. And so I want to give you two things this morning that will help you heal. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. Two things that will help you heal from church hurt. Number one, you need to remember your worth. Yeah. And the reason why judgment hurts so much is because we feel like at the end of the day that it attacks our value. It makes us feel cheap and worthless. It makes us feel like we're less than. And the reality is this here this morning. I cannot guarantee that every person will see you for the treasure that you really are. I can't do that. But what I can do is teach you to decrease the opinions of other people while increasing the opinions of God about your life. Now, now here's the thing. This is the hardest thing for somebody like me to get you to believe. The hardest thing for me to get you to believe is that you hold great value to God. 
Because we have a, a tendency to hear God loves you and then we just quickly dismiss it. We quick, quickly dismiss it. And so how can I communicate to you in a way, maybe in a way you've never heard before, of how valuable you are to God and how much worth you have to him? You see, you can always tell how much somebody values something by how much time they invest into it. And, and so I want you this morning, I, I want you to think about where God uh, has chosen to give his spirit. And I want you to think about the amount of time that he chose to give his spirit uh, in times throughout the human race. And the first place that I think about this morning is the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> you see, the Ark of the Covenant, it was specially designed by God. It was designed by God himself, and it was so that he could come and that his presence could meet with man. And so the box was specifically designed of, a, of only the most precious of materials. It really, if it was around today, if you could find it today, it, it would be priceless. Uh, but I can tell you this, that the gold alone and today's standard for the Ark of the Covenant would be about $63 million worth of gold. That doesn't even count the, the silver, the bronze, or, or the precious stones. About $63 million worth of gold. And so this was a multi-million dollar box that God chose to meet with people every once in a while so that God would give a little bit of his time to it. And then you think about Solomon's temple that came after the ark, Solomon's temple, it took about seven years to construct. It was because God wanted a temple that he and his people could meet together. And so once it was done, Solomon's temple, it was, it was considered one of the, the wonders of the world. And I want you to think about this this morning. The silver that was used alone was $22 billion. And the gold that was used for Solomon's temple and today's currency was about $196 billion. And so now just combining those two things alone, Solomon's temple had a worth of $216 billion and God would meet with people there just annually. And then you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 that says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that God has permanently set up residence in you? And so God will give a multi-million dollar box an occasional visit. He'll give a multi-billion dollar building an annual appearance. But you and all of your missteps and all of your mishaps, he has chosen to reside in permanently. Now listen here this morning. <clears throat> yes, you were handmade by God. Yes, you were created in God's image. But that's not actually why you're worth so much. You're worth so much because verse 20, it says this. It says, you were bought with a price, price the precious blood of God's own son. Yes. And so the only way to help you grasp how valuable you are, the only way to communicate your value was God giving his own son. And so this is what I'm saying this morning. If God has chosen to live permanently in you and give up his son for you, then why do you care so much about what they say about you? Their criticism cannot remove your worth. It can't. And so the first thing to know if you've been judged is that you have incredible priceless worth to God. Now, here's the second thing. The second thing to know when it comes to healing is this, is that you need to choose to show grace that you didn't receive. You need to choose to show grace that you didn't receive. You know, everyone responds differently to hurt, but you know, all of us have had these imaginary confrontations with uh, the person uh, that hurt us. You know, I'm sure you could attest to the time where somebody hurt you and you just reflect back on that time. You're like, man, I wish I would have thought of that. You know, their hair looked terrible that day. I wish I would have told them that. And you start kind of rehearsing uh, these things and it's just kind of like a, a, a broken record and, and you start sharpening your words internally of all the things that, that you could have said. But can I tell you something here this morning? The more you sharpen your words the more it shreds your peace. Mm, I'm going to say that again this morning. The more you sharpen your words, 
the more it shreds your peace. And not only that, but it makes you exactly like them. And so you become the very thing that wounded you. And so you have a choice here today to either become like them or to give them grace. That's your choice. Either you're no better than they were or you learn to give grace to them. Now, here's what grace is. Grace is when I choose not to enact revenge either internally or externally, but instead I try to understand where you're coming from. You know, we've all heard the, the saying plenty of times that, that, that people that hurt others, that they're experiencing hurt in their own lives. And that's really uh, where the motive comes from. And, and, and so grace is saying, I'm going to try to understand why you would say such a thing. I, I'm going to try to understand why you would cast such a judgment. I'm going to try to understand why you would do such a thing. Now, there's a prayer that, that really reframes how we think of other people. And I'm going to read it to you this morning. The, the name of this prayer is called a different kind of prayer. I want you to hear this this morning. This is what it says. It says, Dear Heavenly Father, help us to remember that the jerk who cut us off in traffic last night Is a single mother who worked nine hours that day and was rushing home to cook dinner, help with homework, do laundry, and spend a few precious moments with her children. Help us to remember that the pierced, tattooed, disinterested young man at the store that can't make change correctly is a worried 19-year-old college student balancing the stress of final exams and fears that he will not be able to get a student loan next year. Remind us that the scary looking bum begging for money in the same spot every day who really should get a job is a slave to addictions that could only imagine our worst nightmare. Help us to remember that the elderly couple walking annoyingly slow through the aisles blocking our shopping progress are savoring the moment that based on the biopsy report that she just got last week that says that this will be their last year to shop together. Heavenly Father, remind us that Of all our gifts you've given, the best one is love. Open our hearts to those who are close to us and to all humanity. Help us to see people the way you do, not as a problem to avoid, but as a person to be loved. Amen. 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 You see, if you've been hurt by judgment, you have an incredible opportunity today. You can stop the perpetuating problem and actually become what the church should have been to begin with. You know, the thing about grace is grace is the one thing that the church can offer the world that it can't find anywhere else. You you know, you don't have to be a, a Christian to build homes for the homeless. Uh, You don't have to be a Christian to pass legislation or or to elect somebody into power. You don't have to be a a Christian to give uh, charitable donations. You don't have to be a a Christian to get on a plane and fly across seas and, and do humanitarian work. But where else can you find grace? Because, you know, in this world, it's quid pro quo. It's an eye for an eye. It's a, it's a tooth for a tooth. It's you get what you deserve. In this world, when somebody does something to you, you do it back 10 times. But where else can the world find grace? The world doesn't operate in grace. No. Have you ever cut somebody off in traffic and cut them off on the interstate? And right after they said, hey, buddy, I forgive you. You want the lane? I'll give you the shoulder too. Have you ever been to a baseball game and and, and the the ref makes a bad call and and instead of everybody yelling and jumping up and cursing, have you ever seen somebody jump up and say, no, 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 now's not the time to be judgmental? (laughs) Never. It doesn't happen. And so the church uniquely offers grace and God is looking for a people that will show grace And stand for truth. Again, God is looking for a people that number one will show grace. And number two, they will offer the people truth. They will stand for truth. And so I just want to say it this morning. If you've got an addiction, join us. If you've got a struggle with sin, join us. Do you lose your temper? Join us. Maybe you don't even know what you fully believe yet. And you just need space to to figure it out. We invite you to join us. You are welcome here regardless of your issues. 
miss you. You are welcome here regardless of your past. You're welcome here. And you're welcome here because we have found a God who loves us unconditionally, a God who transformed us, a God who showed us that there's a better way, and he changed what we used to be. And so you're welcome here. Hallelujah. There's no judgment here, just Jesus. The balance between, between truth and grace. And that's what God is looking for. And by the way, that's what the world is searching for as well. The perfect balance between truth and grace. Singers and musicians can come back this morning. If you've been hurt, if you're struggling with hurt on the inside... Number one, you need to remember your value. You need to know how much worth you have in the eyes of God. You need to realize the price that was paid for your salvation, for your soul. And number two, you have the opportunity to show grace in a way that you didn't receive. To whom much is given, much is required. And now that you have received grace, you now have the opportunity to show that grace to others.